Now this better this picture actually reveals a rich uh, a rich ensemble of physics. There's a rich variety of physics that actually stems out from this from this diagram. Just looking at this diagram, first of all, if you have zero Kelvins, this system cannot emit any photons. It cannot emit any energy. Because the emission of energy requires an electron is demoted to a level that's lower in energy. But all these levels are already filled. So this electron that has the highest energy cannot drop into a level that's lower. Because all the lower levels are already filled. There's no space. None of these electrons can drop to a lower energy level because all the lower energy levels are already filled. So there can be no emission of light from this system. However, if somehow one of the electrons, say one of the electrons is promoted to a higher level, a hole is created here. So there's a vacancy here. The electrons from the higher level can, can keep an eye on this vacancy. Now the energy of the system likes to be lower, so some electron from a higher energy level can drop into this vacancy and emit photons. Okay. So they, these are nice constructs, these are nice toy examples that you can play, play with. Now what if I raise, now this, this actually is really important. If this spacing between energy levels is much larger than the temperature, which is true here because the temperature is zero Kelvin anyway, all the bosons are going to coalesce. They are going to fall into the lowest energy state. Okay? So far, so good. This energy spacing is actually really small. In real systems, it's really small. So the temperature has to be really small if you would like to have the bosons in the ground state. Because this spacing is small, you need to have really small temperatures to have the bosons coalesce into the ground state. OK? This is an example of a structure of a system which is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. But there are more clever ways of having higher temperatures and achieving this Bose-Einstein condensate. And I'm going to talk about this in the remainder of the lecture. But let's move on. This system here that I have described is an example of a quantum gas. <coughs> because each of these levels is occupied. So all of the levels here, up to the Fermi level, they are occupied. This level here is occupied. So this is an and the electrons, they are in the lowest energy state. So this is an example of a quantum gas. The distinction between a quantum and a classical gas will become clear in a minute. Now let me raise the temperature a little bit. Okay? Now I draw the two harmonic oscillators. And I raise the temperature a little bit. Of course the energy levels don't change. The placeholders for the electrons don't change.
combustion takes place here at the Fermi level. In devices, in semiconductors, transistors, all the action is taking place at the Fermi level. None of these electrons, they, these electrons are experiencing claustrophobia. They cannot move. They don't have room to wiggle because there are no neighboring levels that are vacant. Only electrons that are in the vicinity of the Fermi level, they can, they can be excited. They can go to higher energy levels. So what's going to happen here is up to the Fermi level, below the Fermi level, hardly anything changes. By the way, you want to keep the number of electrons constant. You're not pumping in electrons. So only near the Fermi level do some of the electrons go to higher states. OK? So some of the electrons are promoted. If I were to make a diagram of the occupancy, so up to the Fermi level, all the states are occupied. So this is my energy axis, E. And this is my, let's call this the occupancy axis. So up to the Fermi level, I have some occupancy. And the occupancy is constant. Here I have a Dirac delta function for the occupancy. Here what I have is an occupancy which is smeared. Some of the electrons can go beyond the Fermi level. Now the Fermi level, in other words, is shifted, goes up. So above this Fermi level, some of the electrons can go beyond the original Fermi level, the Fermi level at 0 Kelvin. This is the Fermi level at 0 Kelvin. Some of the electrons are spilled over into the higher energy levels because they are available, and the temperature is available. So thermal energy is available, which excites these electrons to beyond the Fermi level at 0 Kelvin. Agree? Now what happens in this case is, of course now the temperature is going up. The temperature is sufficient to overcome this gap. So some of these gaps are overcome. So some of these bosons will pick up this energy. Energy is always conserved. Energy is being provided by the system. So some of these bosons, still a large number of them will be the ground state, but some of them can be promoted to high energy levels. OK? So this is how the situation is going to change if the temperature goes up. All right? Now if the temperature is really, 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 really large, which means much larger than any of these spacings, then what's going to happen in the extreme case is the following scenario. Both of these cases correspond to quantum gas. This is quantum gas at 0 Kelvin. This is a quantum gas at slightly higher temperature. Now if I increase the temperature to a large amount, which means that my temperature is really, really large, much larger than 0 Kelvin, then I would have a situation that corresponds to the following. <coughs> In this scenario, these fermions, they will be scattered into high energy, they will go into high energy levels. So the occupancy will be rare, will be scarce. So these levels will be scarcely populated. Because electrons have been promoted to higher and higher energy levels. If the temperature is really large. Okay? Likewise for bosons. there will be a large scatter, a large distribution of occupancies. 
if the temperature is really large because now this temperature is available to excite the fermions as well as the bosons. And this is an example of a classical gas. This is what happens in a classical gas. And a classical gas is characterized by the following. The, the degree of occupancy of each level is much smaller than 1. Here the degree of occupancy of levels up to the Fermi level is almost 100%. 1. Each level has a 100% probability of being occupied up to the Fermi level. Here, the degree of occupancy is much, of each level is much smaller than 1. In other words, I have a dilute distribution of fermions inside the energy level. It's really dilute. These fermions are spaced far apart because the large energies are available, provided by the thermal energy, and the electrons distribute themselves in within the energy manifold, and likewise for, for the bosons. Now what I would like to emphasize is in a classical gas, the fermions and the bosons, how do I define a classical gas? I define a classical gas in the following way. The occupancy of each level is much smaller than one. One means 100%. There is a small probability that each level is occupied. You see, most of the levels here are empty. They're not occupied. So the degree of occupancy of these levels is really small. This is what I mean by classical gas. Or in other words, in a classical gas, the particles try to stay away from each other. They don't like to overlap. They don't like to interact with one another. They remain aloof from one another. They stay away from one another. They don't want to bump into one another. They stay away from each other. Right? They don't like to hang out together. They stay away from each other. They, okay? This is what I mean by a classical gas. And this transition from a quantum gas to a classical gas takes place at a certain temperature. We would like to find out where does this transition take place from the quantum regime to the classical regime. There was a question at the back. Yes. Uh, sir, the, does the energy of these electrons follow the Maxwell distribution? In this case, yes. In this case, the electrons, <coughs> the fermions, have a distribution which is given by 1 EHF over KBT plus 1, or let's call it E. This is the distribution for fermions. This is called the Fermi Dirac distribution. This is the distribution for bosons 1 over E. E over A over KBT minus 1. We've already seen this in lasers, photons or bosons. And if the temperature is really large, then the distribution of fermions and bosons becomes identical and it's proportional to E for minus E over KBT. Okay? So this obeys maximum Boltzmann distribution. Okay, good question. Okay, I would like to move on here. Now I would like to talk about the what we're going to what we we're, we're discussing in these lectures. We're discussing about physics at the edge, the edge of human ingenuity. Right? We've been talking about lasers. 1960s, when the lasers were invented, that was the edge of physics. You creating lasers, a laser beam, which is a collection of bosons. Photons are bosons, and all of them, all of the bosons are in the same quantum state. A laser is a Bose-Einstein condensate for photons. All of the photons, they're coming out in the same quantum state. They're in the ground state, even though the temperature is really large. Okay. In the previous lecture, we talked about laser cooling. 
Laser cooling, when it was invented in the 1990s, how in the world are you going to get a temperature of the order of a nano Kelvin? Which is 10 to the power minus 9 Kelvin. Every known solid, every known material known to mankind is going to solidify well before this temperature. How can you cool a gas which is really hot? Gas is something hot. Steam is hotter than water. How can you cool a gas of atoms to a temperature of the order of 10 to the power minus 5 or 10 to the power minus 6 or 10 to the power minus 7 Kelvin? With the help of lasers, which actually are pumping in energy to the system, which actually are source of heat. This is physics at the edge, right? This is physics at the real extreme of human ingenuity and creativity. Now what we would like to discuss is, is the experiment in which Bose-Einstein condensates can be created <coughs> at temperatures which are above this range. You see, it's easy to create a Bose-Einstein condensate if our temperature is smaller than this gap. Now if I take a quantum well of dimensions 1 centimeter, it's a 3D infinite well, and I look at the ground state, and I look at the first excited state, then the gap between these levels is going to be pi square, h bar square, 2m l square, the first excited state will have quantum numbers 2, 1, 1, 2 square, plus 1 square, plus 1 square. This is the energy of the first excited state for a 3D quantum well. Minus the ground state. So if I compute this energy, this is going to be a tiny, tiny energy. So if I would like to have bosons in the ground state, I would have to have a temperature that's smaller than this tiny energy gap. And this is a tiny energy, you can calculate this energy. The temperature is required around the order of say 10 for minus 15 or minus 16 Kelvin, which are impossible to achieve. So it seems extremely difficult to make both Einstein condensates. However, the 2001 Nobel Prize was awarded to three scientists <laughs> for making Bose-Einstein condensates at higher temperatures. And higher means of the order of 10 to the power minus 9 or 10 to the power minus 8 Kelvin. And you achieve these temperatures by laser Doppler cooling. So higher on our scale is this. So you can beat this limit imposed by quantum mechanics by laser cooling and achieve a temp and, but how do you do that? How can you have a both Einstein condensates at higher temperatures? The idea is simple and this is what I'm going to describe. If I have a cavity or a chamber of atoms in a gaseous form For example, the original experiment had vapors of rubidium. Okay? Atoms of rubidium. Uh, this is a group 2 element, rubidium, an alkaline red earth. Now, there's a certain density of atoms. N atoms per unit volume. Now, what if I would like to make a quantum gas and I would like to achieve a Bose-Einstein condensate? What I would like to have is the following. I would like to have a low density of these atoms. Now, each of these atoms, of course, is described by a wave function. Okay? Each wave function for this atom, suppose it's a wave packet. 
It's not a plane wave. It's a localized particle. A localized particle means that the wave function is like a, a wave packet. This gaseous atom will have a wave packet. This gaseous atom will have a wave packet. This will have a wave packet. This will have a wave packet. Wave packet. Now, if this is a dilute gas, the wave packets will not interact with one another. Okay? Now, this size of this wave packet is given by lambda. Okay? What do we want? We, we know what this lambda is. It depends upon the temperature of the gas. We know that the first point that I would like to emphasize is that the energy of these atoms is half mv squared. But this is related to the temperature. How is this energy related to the temperature? It's 3 over 2 kBT. <laughs> I can also write this as P square over 2 M. Correct? Now the energy of these gaseous atoms is related to the temperature and is given by P square over 2 M. But the wavelength is related to this P. Now this P determines this wavelength, which is the size of this wave function. So each of these atoms has a wave function, a wave packet, a wave pulse. And what we would like to have is that these wave packets don't mingle with one another. The electrons like to remain separate. These, sorry, these atoms would like to remain distinct. They would like to remain non-overlapping. We don't want these wave packets to intermingle with one another. We would like to have a dilute atom, a dilute gas of atoms. We would like to have this scenario over here. Okay? All right. So what? The next thing I would like to find out is the wave. Is this wave function? This wave function is related to p by a h over lambda. So this means that my lambda is h over p. But my p is given by this. So my lambda is h over 3 mass of these atoms, kBt. All right. Now what do I want? If I increase the temperature, the wavelength goes down. When the wavelength goes down, these atoms remain non-overlapping because the wave, wave packets squeeze together. They become localized. When they become localized, the atoms remain distinct. There is no overlap between the wave functions. And I have this scenario. I have a classical gas. Agree? When the temperature is large, the wavelength is small, this wave packet is squeezed. It's squeezed means that the atoms are now, the wave packets of the atoms are non-overlapping. The atoms are not sticking together. They stay put. They remain away from one another. They would like to, in a, in a sense, they are repelling one another. They stay away from one another. They're non-overlapping. The wave functions remain distinct. And we have a classical gas of non-interacting particles. This is what we have. This is the scenario we have. We have the classical situation at high temperature. Now, if, on the other hand, we lower the temperature, this wave number, wavelength is going to go up. So this wave packet is going to spread. At a certain point, the spreading of the wave packet becomes equal to the spacing between the atoms. And the wave functions start to overlap. First of all, I would like to find out what the average spacing between the atoms. Okay, and then I would like to compare it to the wavelength. May I ask you to 
मेरे पास एक चेंबर है जिसमें ये एटम्स हैं गैस के और एक टेम्परेचर है हर एटम के साथ वाबस्ता एक वेव पैकेट है ये प्लेन वेव नहीं है क्योंकि एक ग्लोबलाइज पार्टिकल है अब ये जो वेव पैकेट है इसकी एक करेक्टरिस्टिक वेवलेंथ है वो वेवलेंथ मोमेंटम पे डिपेंड करती है ठीक मोमेंटम टेम्परेचर पर डिपेंड करता है जिसके नतीजे में वेवलेंथ और टेम्परेचर के दरमियान इस तरह का रिलेशनशिप है अगर टेम्परेचर बढ़ता है ये वेवलेंथ कम होती है वेवलेंथ कम होने का मतलब ये है कि ये वेवलेंथ ये वेव पैकेट स्क्वीज हो रहे हैं तो देर इज नो चांस ऑफ ओवरलैप बिटवीन द वेव पैकेट ऑफ द डिफरेंट एटम्स एंड दीज वेव पैकेट रिमेन नॉन ओवरलैपिंग आई हैव नॉन इंटरक्टिंग एटम्स देर वेव पैकेट आर सेपरेट So I have a non-interacting gas, like a classical gas, and I have this situation. I do not have a Bose-Einstein condensate. What I really want now is I would like these wave packets to merge together. If these wave packets merge together and there is an overlapping wave function for all of these atoms, one giant macroscopic wave function, as we have in a laser, will achieve a Bose-Einstein condensate. In order to find out at what temperature would these wave packets overlap, we need to find out what's on average the distance between atoms, right? Now the distance. We, let's find out the distance between atoms. So I have two points here: energy, momentum, and wavelength. Now I would like to find out the distance. N is the number of atoms per say. Cubic centimeter. The volume occupied by each atom. So n is like a density. The volume occupied by each atom <coughs> was the volume occupied by each atom in this gas in this chamber. How is it related to n? It's one over n, right? This is the number of atoms per unit volume. This is the volume per unit atom. So this is the volume. Now, what's the average spacing? Or if I assume that each atom has a spherical existence, and this is the volume of each atom in a sense, I'm modeling these atoms by spheres of a certain volume. Which is the range in which the atom exists, which is the range of influence of the atom. So the size of the atom is denoted by some radius r. How is this r related to this n? This is the volume. So, so I know that four over three pi r cube is one over n. So my r. So I can write what n three. Over four pi. <coughs> One by three, right? <coughs> three over four. So this is my radius. This is the radius of each atom. This is the size of each atom. Now I would like. I have two regimes. The classical regime is. In which I have a classical gas, nothing interesting happens. It's just no quantum mechanics is needed. This means that R is much larger than the wavelength, and I have non-overlapping wave functions, non-overlapping wave packets, and I have a gas of non-interacting particles, just like a gas of. Argon, gas of oxygen molecules, gas of hydrogen, the oxygen, the nitrogen in this room. I have a classical gas of rubidium. Nothing interesting. But what I would like to have, I would like to have these wave functions to overlap so that I have one giant wave function. Which means that if I would like to make the classical to the quantum transition, I would like to have an R that is smaller or of Same order as lambda, but I already know what lambda is. It's over there. So what I need is an R, which is given by this R three over four pi n 
1 over 3, let me put an equality here, or less than. This must be smaller than lambda, which means the wave number should be large, so that the wave packets overlap. And I cannot say that this is the wave packet of this particular atom. It's one wave function for the entire gas of atoms. All of those atoms are going to share the same wave function. Okay? And this is what I mean by Bose-Einstein condensate. So a lambda over there is h over 3 n a b t. Let me put a square here and put an under root here. Okay? <coughs> now this means, now I can just do some algebra over here. Uh, this means Over 4 by n, I raise this to 2, this becomes h square 3n abt So if this condition is satisfied, I will enter the quantum regime, I will have a quantum gas in which the wave functions are now overlapping. Now let me just rearrange this little bit and find out the temperature that is required to achieve this. Okay, so there are two. So I need to know what N is. And I need to know what the temperature is to achieve this quantum gas, to make this quantum gas. So if I do the algebra, I don't want to waste your time doing the algebra. What I need is that my n is smaller than 3m abt h over h squared <coughs> 3 by 2. If my density of atoms is smaller than this number, I have achieved a quantum gas. Okay? This M is called the quantum concentration. Just a minute, please. And if I were to replace make T the subject of this equation, then T turns out to be H squared N raised power 2 by 3 over 3 N kV. Alright. So if this, if I were to achieve this temperature in a gas of rubidium atoms, what's going to happen is that the wave functions are going to overlap. And I will have one giant wave function for all the rubidium atoms. Just one giant wave function. This is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. And the temperature that is required to achieve this Bose-Einstein condensate is given by this formula. Now in the original experiment performed by, uh, by Ketterle and co-workers uh, had an N, so they had a trap. So what they had was the following. They have a chamber in which rubidium atoms were loaded. A large number of rubidium atoms were loaded. Okay? And this chamber was placed inside a magnetic field. The magnetic field had a potential like this. It's like a bowel-shaped magnetic field. Which means that the rubidium atoms <coughs> like to live inside the bowel because the energy is lower. This is an energy manifold. The rubidium atoms like to live here. Now laser light comes in. 
from a particular direction and then from the transverse direction, the opposite direction and then laser light comes in from the top laser light comes in from the bottom laser light comes in from the front laser light comes in from the back so I have six laser beams impinging on this gas of rubidium atoms and I know the energy level structure, the F0, the atomic transition each of these laser beams is detuned so I am achieving laser cooling Okay, and then all of this is inside a magnetic field so the atoms get cooler, cooler and cooler and when the atoms get cooler by the action of Doppler cooling the temperature goes down alright, so I need to have a certain minimum temperature this temperature has to be smaller than a certain number now, if there are 2,000 atoms here, first of all, <coughs> there is a large number of atoms. Okay? Each of these atoms has a certain energy. So, look at this bowel shape here. Now, if I change the potential so that this bowel becomes shallower, which means I apply magnetic fields in such a way that the bowel becomes shallower and some of the higher energy rubidium atoms, they will jump off the bowel they will go out of the bowel just as, it, as, as if evaporation is taking place the higher energy rubidium atoms are jumping off the bowel so only the lower energy atoms remain inside the bowel, inside the trap all the higher energy rubidium atoms, they fall out of the trap they go out because I changed the magnetic fields in such a way that the energy landscape has changed, the potential energy has changed, the bowel becomes shallower. This process, by the way, is called evaporative cooling. So, as a result of evaporating cooling, there are two effects that are achieved. The temperature is lowered because the higher energy rubidium atoms have fallen off. The rubidium atoms are already cooled by Doppler cooling. They are already cooled by Doppler cooling. Now I am changing this trap. What the trap change does is that even the higher energy rubidium atoms, even beyond the Doppler cooling, they fall off. So even the temperature is lowered even further because of this second stage of evaporative cooling. And it also achieves the effect that this concentration M also goes down, the number of atoms inside the trap goes down, the density is further reduced. So this density is reduced, I need a certain temperature and both of these effects are achieved simultaneously. If I have 2000 atoms here inside the trap, I can insert the values, I can put in 87 nucleons and the size and the mass of a proton in a nucleon, I can find what this concentration, what this number is going to be the temperature turns out to be about 10 is for minus 7 Kelvin. So if I were to achieve this temperature, all of these wave functions are going to overlap and I will get one giant wave function at temperatures 10 to the power minus 7 Kelvin which are far higher than this temperature which is of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 Kelvin. So with the help of laser cooling and with the help of evaporative cooling, I can make a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a macroscopic quantum state. Now you can see Bose-Einstein condensate with all kinds of atoms and ions. This setup is called a magneto-optical trap. You are trapping these atoms inside a magnetic field and with the help of six laser beams impinging in from all directions, you are achieving doctor cooling, evaporative cooling gives you the second stage of cooling. Evaporative cooling is simply changing the magnetic field structure so that the higher energy rubidium atoms fall off from the bowel and you left with a small density of atoms which are even lower in temperature and this is how you can achieve a Bose-Einstein condensate. Alright, so see you on Thursday.